Good morning, Seawolves, and uh, welcome back to uh, the show. I hope that you have your delicious drink already, because this show, of course, we always start with a delicious uh, drink. I prefer uh, coffee. Here we go. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Super nice. So, uh, what we've been witnessing over the last 30 hours, let's say, it might be the sailing battle for the centuries, right? So many crazy uh, twists and turns, near speed records, as I kind of predicted on the first day with the weather. So, uh, really a lot of interesting things to uh, uh, talk about. This front that we've now sailed through, it's been pretty windy uh, since yesterday afternoon. And we rounded the virtual waypoint a few hours ago and we're heading back to Kashkai now and it should be a very wet and windy day, I think. So it's um, nice to be going fast, but uh, definitely a different lifestyle. We're leading the 65 fleet. We've got Axon Oval about seven miles back and a few miles to Lewin and uh, sailing Poland about 10 miles back directly behind us. So. Um, I think we're in a pretty good spot. Uh, I think the main stress will now be just obviously going fast today, but then uh, it'll be the approach into Kashkai because it'll get light again and we'll be managing that, which will be the next or the last big hurdle, I would say. And uh, also some things that, uh, looking at the tracker and kind of what happened, that I actually don't understand. So um, I can't wait actually to talk to uh, some of the skippers once they uh, get back uh, in. I got several uh, Zoom interviews uh, uh, planned once they uh, reach Cascais and I'm very interested to find out some of the details about some of the things that happened during this particular uh, leg because some of it just doesn't seem to make sense. Now um, of course uh, to start let's rewind a little so I'll bring you back into the screen here uh, on the tracker to kind of go to the point where you know things became really interesting and uh, that was actually uh, kind of uh, you know around here once uh, 11th hour racing and linked out kind of made their way outside of the uh, the main group and started to uh, you know pick up quite a little bit of a uh, of distance you know they were they were basically about 20 miles 25 miles or so uh, ahead of the rest of the group so you know, a pretty good lead in this relatively, you know, it's about a thousand mile uh, leg, so relatively short leg for, you know, the ocean race and uh, a pretty substantial uh, uh, lead, which, you know, by now they, they completely lost and everybody's almost, you know, in, uh, in one line. We'll get to that later. But um, at this point, uh, they were kind of moving into uh, some stronger uh, wind, so that's the point where that northwestern breeze were kind of coming in. Uh, if we if we can zoom in, we see that they're not quite yet in those very strong winds yet. When we look at the speeds at this point, so they're not in super strong winds. Generally, the wave uh, the wave state is you know probably a little bit uh, flatter still at that point before the stronger winds hit. And we see them clocking just amazing uh, top speeds here. I see 27 knots here uh, on screen for 11 hour racing team, but uh, actually scrolling to it, um, I think the highest that I saw in here was 29.8, so really, really fast. I mean, when I was in childhood, uh, also racing in the night, we hit 19.8, and I thought that was really, really fast. But so that's actually a full 10 knots faster uh, than that, which is, you know, really, really crazy. But these Imakas, let's face it, are just super, super fast uh, in the right uh, conditions. But we saw them uh, constantly clocking basically 25 to 30 knots uh, type of speeds. Then as they move into the stronger breeze, and so, you know, probably a bit more uh, intense wave states, etc., we see that actually quickly uh, uh, fall off and they go back to speeds that are, you know, more uh, like 24, 25 knots, uh, etc. Which I thought was interesting uh, to see, as you can see here now, you know, 25, 26, 23. And so it's interesting the, the kind of relationship uh, uh, on the Amakas 
between uh, especially the C state uh, and uh, you know and the the final uh, top speeds because in a way um, you know if we look at this particular picture and what happened here it really kind of shows that uh, you know once so so during the the Van der Globe we also saw this that when there were relatively light winds let's say you know 10 to maybe 14 knots or so that's really that sweet spot where the wave state is you know calm enough flat enough for uh, the boats to really develop lots and lots of speeds and for those wings the foils to work optimally uh, while uh, as soon as the wind goes you know kind of over that speed then uh, even though you know they have of course more wind to develop that speed because the wave state just gets more intense um, either uh, the, the the captains bring down the speed a little bit because of course they have to you know watch out for breaking the boat and the, the power and the slamming is just super super intense so they just constantly bring it back to a speed that is say around 25 knots or a little bit below that um, or uh, you know maybe because of the, the sea state uh, in, in general they're just not able really to you know kind of keep those speeds uh, going for whatever reason so I think that'll be kind of an interesting question uh, to ask the guys once they uh, uh, come back kind of what the different factors are that are going in there and if it's true that you know once you have more than say 14 15 knots of wind and you know once there's a kind of sea state that fits with that has really kind of developed you know the waves that you would expect if you have that for you know prolonged uh, time and that actually the wave state is uh, you know very much the limiting factor in the speed here but anyway that, I thought that was a uh, very interesting then of course there was the uh, the kind of the incident uh, with uh, with 11 hour racing where uh, Charlie Enright mentioned that uh, so the, the Mokkas are more or less steering on autopilot whenever they go over you know 15 15 knots uh, or so because the violence of the Mokkas is so uh, severe the slamming is so severe but also the water coming over the boat is just in such amounts and at such a speed that it's just not really possible for a human anymore to kind of go uh, out there it's just too extreme so they really heavily rely on the autopilot and also they rely on an object collision uh, system so uh, I, I kind of didn't really hear it mentioned in this particular race uh, so far in the commentary but uh, all of the Mokkas uh, actually except maybe uh, Team Germany I don't know they probably have it also but I haven't seen that confirmed uh, but they all have this uh, this system in the top of the mass which is basically three uh, cameras infrared cameras that are scanning kind of you know the the sea in front of the boat and uh, if they see you know any kind of object in the way they are able to override the, uh, the autopilot and you know steer the boat into uh, winds to avoid hitting something because the the visual for the captain is generally so uh, uh, poor and of course we saw in the Van der Globe several of the boats you know hit different uh, you know uh, un undefined uh, uh, floating objects uh, with very destructive uh, uh, consequences so uh, you know th that's the other system that they really rely on to kind of keep safe while they're you know cruising down those ultra fast um, uh, courses but so uh, what happened is that um, Charlie mentioned that when they hit a wave somehow that uh, knocked loose uh, one of their uh, either gyroscopes or compasses I'm not 100% sure actually on that I think it was a compass and uh, that happened to be the compass that uh, was responsible for uh, the uh, for the autopilot uh, calibration so um, that we should be able to see somewhere in their line kind of a strange uh, tack I don't know if it's actually possible to well, we don't really see it in their line, I guess. Um, maybe if we zoom in extremely, but I don't exactly know where exactly it is. But uh, you know, definitely confirmed happened. So uh, once their uh, once their compass got knocked loose, they actually uh, made a 360 with the boat while at speed. So while going 20 knots, the autopilot essentially, because that that uh, compass came loose, decided on all its own uh, to just you know make a full on uh, a pirouette. Uh, with the boat so uh, again Charlie hasn't really said you know much about it because you know they're middle in race mode but uh, you know once they uh, once they come back in the Qashqai I think that'll be a very interesting uh, you know question to uh, to ask a little bit more about that and see uh, what happened there. Very interesting 12 hours um, got linked out up here kind of wishing they were more like there but anyway it is what it is. 
their credit, they did a really nice job getting down in front of us, Finisterre, jived and crossed, and then uh, we did a pretty nice job getting into beast mode with our new foils and uh, got on the Fro, which is a preferred sale of ours. We were doing some 25, 26 knot averages, peaks well above 30, and uh, we had a little incident. Came uh, crashing out off a wave and tripped the compass. Turns out the compass is pretty important for the autopilot, so did a lot of hand steering overnight, trying to recalibrate the instruments, and uh, actually did an entire 360. If you can zoom in on the track enough, you probably see us do a little, what looks to be a penalty turn, just a tack, random tack, when we lost the GPS going about 20 knots, so that was interesting. Uh, but anyway, didn't make for a lot of sleep, that's for sure, but um, we are hot on their trail with a lot of opportunity ahead. Uh, spirit's still good. Um, you know, we gotta get through this cold here. We got light air probably for the next four to six hours, something like that, and then it's on. Then, um, as both uh, uh, linked out and uh, eleven are racing, which you know they, they seemed in this kind of uh, you know duel of the fates, you know battle of the titans with the two of them, and uh, at that point had uh, built up a pretty significant lead. I mean, between the two of them, about two miles, and then thirty-five nautical miles uh, to the next uh, to Corum uh, behind them. So a really decent lead, and you think that uh, on a race this. Uh, you know, this short essentially uh, that you know the win might almost be uh, in the bag. Wind prediction was also relatively good with this northwestern wind field kind of moving with uh, um, the fleet, so they should be able to you know actually get the Cascais in pretty good wind conditions. But then something really, really interesting uh, uh, happened, and especially in the light of this being kind of a Volvo 65 versus Imoca uh, race where they you know mixed the start had them cross the same start line together so we really are going to get an honest um, you know look at you know if you take a pretty varied you know pretty long uh, 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 offshore course you know how would the two uh, designs kind of do against each other and you know what we're seeing happen in front of the finish now it really couldn't be more uh, shocking and interesting in a way if you look at the you know quite different DNA of these two boats and seeing how they are finally going to be uh, you know ending up near the finish uh, together. But so at this point, so around you know uh, a little over midnight, we see um, you know that they uh, passed uh, pass the buoy, have a pretty good lead. Then as we fast forward, we see something very interesting happen. So. Basically, the uh, both uh, both uh, linked out and leveled out racing meet kind of the end of this strong wind uh, ridge here, as you can uh, see, and so uh, they they kind of have to make a choice because you can see that they're actually on a pretty good ley line towards the uh, finish, right? They're pretty high up. They have space to kind of move down if they need a little bit extra space to go a little bit more uh, uh, downwind. But they're kind of reaching the end, as you can see here, of the really good uh, breeze. And so, you know, obviously they had to make a decision. Now, as far as the direction of the wind, we've seen the images of the boats using the, uh, the A4. Of course, the Yamakas don't have that, but the Yamakas actually do have, you know, really good downwind sails because they are really downwind sailing monsters. So they have some big spinnakers, etc. Uh, on board, no problem there. They have the sail wardrobe for that. But interestingly enough, we see that both, well, you know, one of them at least chose to uh, make a tag here, uh, linked out uh, first, and something really interesting happened here. Because uh, to me, as far as the racing, somebody uh, once explained to me, you know, it was kind of an offhand comment, but uh, you know, when you're racing, whatever you do, whether you're tacking, jibing, whenever you're changing course, always make sure that your course is bringing you, you know, kind of VMG uh, speaking, closer to the mark. And if if a course is literally taking you further away from the uh, mark, pick pick another course. Doesn't matter if you have to pinch it. Doesn't matter what you do. Um, but whatever you do, always make sure that either slowly or quickly you're making miles towards the mark. Otherwise. It's not going to be good, right? And um, th this is advice that is a little bit counterintuitive, actually. And uh, and you know, as you see, some of the pros also kind of don't take that advice because that's what uh, Eleven Hour Racing, uh, sorry, sorry, linked out in this uh, case was doing because they're taking a course here. And you know, when you look at the picture, you see that kind of the line it puts them on. It literally 
uh, you know, is taking them away miles again. So they're, they're essentially really sailing away from the mark, taking this particular course, where they obviously still have some wind that would, you know, become a lot slower maybe, so their pace towards the finish would be slower, but they could still take a course towards that finish. However, they decide really, you know, probably because of the direction of the wind or whatever, that it's better to make the tag now and that puts them on a course that literally is taking them a little bit away again from where they're essentially trying to go. And so that's an interesting conversation to be had later. I'll definitely, I, I'm definitely going to be talking to Charlie uh, after the race. So I'll definitely ask him about this uh, also because a little bit after uh, he, uh, you know, the 11 hour racing team followed that same strategy. So they also, uh, you know, made a jibe there and uh, took a course that essentially was putting again more miles between them and the finish instead of maybe going into you know more um, you know slow downwind sailing let's say we're just you know putting up some big spinnakers and trying to make their speed in lighter winds hoping that this field because I think the prediction at that point was relatively clear that this field was going to keep uh, catching up with them and that they would have more wind again later you just have to get through it a little bit uh, you know for a little while with some lighter wind but both of them choose not to do that and uh, and take this other uh, uh, course and so when they do that and they're essentially driving away from the finish again when you look at it you know miles wise uh, speaking and so we see the distance to finish also in here just you know increasing uh, again as they take this course we see the rest of the uh, fleet quickly catching up because they still are having strong winds everybody is still doing good both speeds i mean we're seeing 19 knots here basically across the fleet so while they are actually having at this point a negative uh, you know, uh, uh, distance against the finish. So we see them literally, you know, 14.7 knots and 10.0 10 knots speed moving away from the finish at that point, while the rest is doing 18, 17 and 18 knots towards uh, the finish. And at that point, we see this lead that they build up of about 30 nautical miles quickly evaporate. So very interesting uh, uh, choice because had they both not made this jibe, nobody knows of course what was going to happen. I'm sure they had their reasons to make this uh, decision, but it's a very uh, baffling decision looking at the results also. Um, had they just continued on sailing slowly towards the finish, uh, you know, even if they, let's say that their speed would have dropped from 25 knots to nine or something, right? Because they, they seem to be having enough wind for that and they would go to a nine, not speed significantly lower than the rest of the fleet but that would still give them a vmc so you know movement towards the finish of let's say eight knots or something that they're relatively moving towards the finish uh, that still would have uh you know uh, kept they, they would have kept their lead much longer with the rest of the fleet moving 19 or 18 knots towards the finish then you know the, the difference between going eight knots towards the finish or 14 knots away from the finish is 22 knots right so that's a huge uh, decision that they both uh, made and looking at the weather prediction so maybe the 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 weather predictions and the weather data isn't what it was on the ground and there was some kind of reason you know the situation that they're actually and usually a little bit different from you know what we're seeing on the screen on the computer with the different weather models so whatever the situation was there, it's a very interesting decision. And looking at the different data, I don't really quite understand why they made uh, that choice at that time. And so this is a very crucial moment in this particular race. Uh, you know, once that once they made that decision, so they, they keep that for several hours. But in those those few hours, they really lose much of their lead. So, you know, by the time that they're kind of done with this, They've put, you know, 13 nautical miles between themselves and Bureau Valle de is only 16 miles away. So they literally halved their overall uh, lead there and the distance there not quite fair because it's not really distance between them and the finish, but they kind of put some more uh, north south distance uh, between each other. So if you look at it kind of from a horizontal perspective, they're actually much closer uh, to the finish um, or, or their distance to the finish is much more equal at that point. And then as they all start moving towards uh, uh, the finish, we see kind of another two uh, um, uh, jibes in an effort to 
position themselves uh, lower. So, you know, you, we can see the direction of the wind and it really looks like they're just fighting to get down in order to get a nice, uh, you know, kind of straight beam reach angle towards uh, the finish. So that's probably the logic there. But interestingly enough, as the weather progresses and they kind of get to that, you know, desired course, which is, you know, probably the reason why they made these maneuvers, by then, actually, Bureau Valley de has overcome the two of them. So Eleven Hour and Linktar both go to actually position three and four. And both Corum and Bureau Valley de are now closer to the finish, though they are a little bit more to the north. And then, as we see the wind prediction kind of move in, they all move into this kind of, you know, the edge where they still have strong wind and where this kind of lower winds begin. Now, that field does move with them, but uh, yeah, the, the angle, at the point where both 11 hour racing and linked out are for my mind really doesn't look that much better than you know uh, probably 20 or 30 or 40 miles more upwind where the rest of the fleet is doing equal speeds getting an equal distance uh, to the finish and then as the fleet kind of fans out uh, we see again uh, that everybody sort of in, in, in you know lighter and lighter winds getting more and more together bringing us kind of to the uh, position now where we uh, you know where we do see 11 our racing team now they, they kind of went more up towards the middle of the fleet and I think they are in the best position uh, to finish so w whatever they did maybe they avoided some catastrophe uh, there but with the enormous amount of lead that they gave up for my mind, if they just cruised, cruised on straight to the finish, now hindsight of course is 2020, and that goes both for a linked out and 11 hour racing team, I think they, they would have ended uh, you know, in the same place where they are now, probably five hours ago, right? I, I think they would have still retained that uh, lead. So very, very interesting tactical battle going on there as far as this weather and I'm not quite sure what they were looking at exactly why they made uh, that that choice so uh, but of course when we look at the the result now which is just mightily uh, interesting picture so you know we all remember the light start everybody very close together and now we see the entire fleet basically on one vertical line you know uh, uh, close uh, to the finish and uh, you know, if we look at the weather here, so they're more or less all of them uh, on a beam reach right now. And um, yeah, I guess distance to finish wise, uh, so uh, uh, it's kind of uh, offshore team Germany and uh, an 11th hour racing team. They're kind of ping ponging between uh, you know, position one and two with you know, 0 0.3 nautical miles between them. So they're very, very uh, uh, close distance to finish, you know, almost. Uh, exactly uh, the same. I would say that 11 hour racing is in a slightly better position because uh, Team Germany here, they, they're going to have their fight their way a little bit upwind um, while um, uh, offshore, while uh, 11 hour racing is going to be able to, to downwind this uh, a little bit, which again is interesting if you think about the fact that they chose to lose so much height on their position. Uh, you know, giving away so much opportunity to kind of go on that kind of ideal slightly downwind line, which the Americans love so much, um, choosing to go for a more downwind position because they easily could have been in a similar position as, you know, Bureau Valet or uh, uh, Maripuri here, which just chose to go, uh, oh, sorry, Corum, uh, which, you know, they just chose to go a little bit higher. Very, very baffling. Uh, situation but anyway that's kind of what happened with the uh, with the Amaka team uh, let's say then let's uh, 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 you know fast backward a little bit in the uh, the Volvo 65 uh, uh, race so let's go back to that same point kind of uh, yesterday before they hit the mark and we basically saw that the, the whole fleet pretty close uh, uh, together right I mean you know 27 miles basically between the le the leader and the rest and they're all you know five six seven nautical miles away from each other so uh, you know for, for most of them they're probably still in view of one or two of the other boats so very very close uh, uh, racing oh, we've seen the Mirpuri Foundation 
basically in the lead for the uh, for the whole uh, uh, time, at least up until that uh, that finish. So they cleared the mark first. We don't see a lot of uh, you know changes in position. Basically, everybody cruising pretty steadily uh, until the mark. Then we have a few shuffles again. So you know some people making uh, that jibe a little bit better uh, than others. And uh, you know, then throughout kind of the long haul, there we see everybody more or less taking the same tax, taking the same course. So no real, uh, you know, strange, unusual tactical maneuvers. People really going for a lot higher course or a lot lower course. Generally, uh, pretty close uh, uh, together. And then uh, you know, as they made their uh, way down, we kind of see that same thing happen. What we saw happen in the Maka fleet. So the leaders kind of reaching the the edge of that stronger northwestern. Uh, wind field and uh, you know maybe pacing themselves a little bit you know making uh, some squirrels here and there to kind of uh, stay in that stronger field and, and and not go outside of that ending up you know in uh, less wind so they're nicely kind of following this you know ridge line uh, you know staying in the wind and then of course we do see that you know some of the boats towards the finishing cascades are choosing kind of to, to go a little bit higher in order to give them the option to you know sail a little bit downwind as they get close to the finish uh, you know if the wind changes or whatever to prevent them having to go upwind uh, that last bit and uh, you know i think uh, looking at the the end result that's kind of the wise uh, decision to kind of be in the, like maybe uh, for some a little bit too high let's say while uh, i think miripuri in a good position uh, but ultimately i think there was one other uh, one in the Volvo fleet. Let me check here. Um, yeah, so that's ba basically Umber Sail uh, is, is kind of the highest located of the rest, but they're also going to have to uh, upwind kind of the last uh, part while uh, Muripuri actually very cleverly kept a higher course, which is you know going to allow them to do a little bit more of a downwind sail towards the finish. And so I think ultimately. Uh, Miripuri is going to uh, take the win here, but you know, we'll have to see what happens. We have kind of this box here that they can't uh, sail into, so they have to go around that. And so uh, that basically means that all of the teams that are a bit lower here, they're going to have to go underneath this and then sail back up, while Miripuri and the others have the chance to actually uh, you know, go over this and then sail downward, which I think is going to you know, save them some time and give them the win. And so you know, same, same for the Mokka fleet where you know we see that they won't be able to sail down this now i think that that's why i think that 11 hours are going to win they're like just high enough to you know make the choice to go around this upward so they're really going to be skating this upward line getting very close to that and then go to the finish which i think is why uh, you know they will win um, you know the other two of course are going to be able to uh, also do this on a downwind but the rest are definitely not in a position to do that so they're going to have to go underneath this and then uh, upwind it to Cascais, which will be a little bit uh, tougher uh, conditions, I guess, and will just likely be a little bit uh, slower. So uh, I'm thinking right now that uh, Merpuri is going to uh, take it in the Volvo 65 class, and uh, 11 hour racing, I think, is going to take it in the Mokka class. But on the other hand, it is a sailing race, so nobody really knows what's going to happen. As far as the, the weather prediction goes, let's take a quick look at it. So we have Kash Kash here, and uh, as you can see right now, very, very light uh, conditions. And uh, as we move through the day, we see that this, uh, this field is uh, coming in here also. So uh, our sailors are gonna have plenty uh, of wind, basically, you know, 20, well, sometimes a little bit lower, but you know, mostly around 20 knots, so very nice. But that is pretty strong wind to, uh, you know, sail upwind in, so I definitely think that the, down, the slightly downwind or beam reaching sailors are going to have the uh, advantage here and you know basically by the end of the day they're all going to be uh, in, they're all going to definitely be finishing within you know a few hours uh, uh, from now. So um, yeah, no, no real weather surprises, just nice strong conditions. Initially everybody thought it would be very very light weather when they came into Kashkars, but uh, we're going to get a spectacular ending. So I uh, hope that uh, the race is going to bring out the helicopters and uh, make some amazing footage. I think it should all look Pretty darn spectacular uh, when they come in. So uh, curious to see who you think will uh, take the win. Let me know in the comments below. 
And uh, yeah, that's it for this update this morning. Hope you uh, enjoy your day. Thank you for watching. Uh, for more, go to the website seawallstv.com. Oh yeah, important to notice. So uh, in August and September, uh, me and Team Childhood are doing four uh, clinics, two offshore and two coastal uh, sailing clinics where you can join us on the actual you know, childhood that is racing uh, right now and you can experience what it's like to do a little bit of offshore or a little bit of coastal uh, sailing. We set up a little bit of a racetrack, it's gonna be really really cool. So uh, check the website seawolvestv.com and find the tab Volvo 65 sailing clinics if you want to join uh, those. I'm happy to say that finally the corona measures here in Holland are going down, down, down. So we're pretty much 100% sure that uh, the event is going to happen and there are still a few spots available. So definitely join us for that one. Well, uh, having said that, have a great day and I'll see you guys tomorrow for the, uh, the retrospective, I guess, and then we'll know who has won. Ciao!